In this video, I want to discuss the phases of group development. These were developed by Bruce Tuckman in 1965, and he developed these four stages of group development. Uh, he called these stages forming, storming, norming, and performing. And as you can see, they progress over time, and, uh, and groups will not move just through these as one simple flow. They'll move forward and backward and get stuck in one and maybe not ever get out of it and and so it just depends on the group where you progress and how much you progress and how you stay in these things but um but this is the basic format i want to discuss so um just to look at each of these and, and kind of where they stand individually um, first of all in forming we tend to see a high degree of guidance uh, we see uh, unclear individual roles um, and the processes are not well established all of this because this is really just the initial group formation um, things aren't very well defined at that time and so um, so there's a little bit of chaos or, or a lot of chaos depending on the situation and uh, so at that time they need a high degree of guidance from you know, the outside sources whoever's directing the group and things so in the storming phase, uh, group members start to see and, and have an initial understanding of how team decisions are going to be made. Those are, those are being made a little more clearly. Uh, and the purpose tends to be a little more clear, but the team relationships are still blurry. Who's doing what and what the connection is between all these people really is still kind of blurry. So, uh, again, it can be kind of a frustrating time. The storming period can, and we'll talk about that in a moment. We're going to break each of these down a little more uh, individually. In the norming stage, though, you see it's on an uptick here. Teams uh, start to get clearer ideas of relationships between the team members and their functions there. Group members become more firmly committed to the team goals uh, and are starting to see some progress there. And then the team processes are uh, optimizing at that, at that stage, the norms. Uh, at the norming stage, those, those processes are starting to optimize and things are running a little more smoothly. And then hopefully, ideally, you'll move into what's called the performing stage, where the group is committed to performing well as a whole, as, a, as, a, as an individual group. They're, per, they're committed to performing well. The focus is on being strategic, so we move beyond kind of these questions of who's doing what and, and you know, what are we doing here. We're now focused on being strategic and being effective and efficient in not only the decision making, but the group processes. And the group functions well with little oversight. They really, at that point in the performing stage, need uh, little oversight from uh, outside uh, outside influences and outside directions. So um, they're, they're running pretty well on their own. So now that we've seen an overview of where these stages uh, take us and kind of what happens at each one, let's take a little deeper dive into each one. So when we look at forming, we have to understand that people have different reasons for joining groups. Um, sometimes that reason is just that they want to be a part of something, that they're drawn uh, to, to being a part of any group. Sometimes it's they're drawn to that specific cause or purpose. Sometimes they're put there uh, without really any choice of their own. The, the, somebody assigns them to that group, right? So we need to understand that people have different reasons for joining groups and that those different reasons for joining can impact the way that they, uh, especially in the forming stage, engage with that group and, and, uh, and view that group. And so... Um, just understanding that there are a variety of reasons that people get involved in groups in the first place. Uh, we also need to think about member diversity, especially at this forming stage. That um, Diversity brings with it a, a great number of opportunities. The, the, the greater diversity of minds that you have, the better that better off that group is probably going to be. You're pulling in, you know, more heads are better than one, really in different ideas, different perspectives, and that can be great from a diversity standpoint. And so uh, groups are encouraged to have a lot of diversity, but it can be a challenge as well, learning to work with people um, from diverse backgrounds and, and with diverse ideas um, can be a challenge. So it's, it's something that in the forming stage, you're going to need to really consider how do we best manage this diversity and best utilize this diversity. And, and uh, so anyway, there are some things that you want to do, and what I'm, what I'm going to call the to-do list in this stage, uh, in each of these stages, we'll have a to-do list. So in the to-do list for the forming stage, you want to make sure that you plan an icebreaker. And I, I'm with you. I hate icebreakers in groups. I, they, they really are kind of irritating to me, but they serve a very important function, especially at this stage of group development in the forming stage. You really need to get to know each other a little bit, at least, so we can um, learn to, to uh, so we can start figuring out what people's strengths are, what their ideas are, what their working style is. So, so plan an icebreaker early on and, and get people involved in that way. I also need to find some common ground. What is it that we have that connects us? Uh, in terms of diversity and our reasons for joining, what is it that we have that connects us? What is it that we can find to hold on to in terms of that common ground? And uh, next, don't make it awkward. Stick to your social niceties. Keep in mind that these are people you may not know very well. 
keep the, uh, at least to a certain degree a sense of formality um, and and just avoid some of the more uh, awkward things that can happen and uh, so and then establish your group goals this is an important time to establish what are the goals of our group what is it that we're working toward and what's our purpose here so be sure that you, you take those steps at the forming stage Next, we want to think about the storming stage and what are some things that are important there. Well, first of all, you're going to experience some different kinds of tension. Um, the first one is what we call primary tension, and that's true when you join any group, uh, and especially in the initial forming and, and uh, earlier stages of that group, but it's true really in the later stages as well. When that group gathers, you're going to have some of that primary tension, some of that uneasiness. I, I think of it like like going on kind of some early dates you, it's kind of stiff you really don't know the other person you're trying to so there's this there's this uncertainty and this this tension that exists in those situations and the same is true for for groups um, you have that initial primary tension and that's always going to be there uh, when when the group initially anytime the group initially gathers uh, you're going to have that primary tension uh, eventually though you're going to have secondary tension which is a little deeper type of tension uh, has to do with you know in this especially in the storming stage um, when, when roles aren't as clear, you may have people stepping on toes, you may have some role confusion, you may have some people questioning um, the purpose or the goals of that group, you're going to have some of these disagreements that happen, and, and that's okay, that's part of uh, it's, it's part of the group process, and, and is, is that disagreement, and, that, and so, but the question is, where do you come out on the other side? Are you going to be able to um, disagree without um, losing function in that group? Are you going to be able to um, not just agree to disagree, but find ways to to, to disagree in um, respectful ways and things. So, and that's how you work through that secondary tension, which is um, especially present in the storming phase of group development as well. So, your to-do list for the storming phase here: first of all, embrace that disagreement. It's healthy. It's healthy, especially to get it out in the open earlier on in the in the, the group. Uh, process. You don't want that hanging on to develop some resentful feelings about different things. So you want to be sure that you embrace that disagreement, um, but also um, uh, keep it civil, right? Which is the other part of that. You want to embrace disagreement, but you also want to keep a civil tongue. You want to make sure that you're you're uh, being respectful to other people and and not creating that interpersonal tension where it um, doesn't necessarily need to exist. You want to be sure that you're listening effectively and engaging in active listening in particular. Um, when people are, are speaking, be sure that you're um, engaging in, in effective listening behaviors, that you're that you're not distracted, that you're not just waiting on your turn to talk, that you're actually uh, engaging in the listening process so that you understand what they're saying, that you effectively uh, interpret what they're saying, that you can remember what they're saying, and then you can respond effectively uh, when you do that. So be an active listener. And then keep a sense of humor, especially in this stage when you're having these tensions, the, the primary tension, the secondary tension, it's okay to use a little humor. Not, again, we don't want to use humor to uh, degrade people, put people down, do things like that, but we want to use humor to, to keep things light. Uh, when somebody makes a mistake, somebody misspeaks or does something, you know, have a sense of humor about it and, uh, and just try and keep things as light as possible. In the norming phase, there are some things we're going to experience, such as we need to identify some explicit versus implicit rules. Um, sometimes groups will lay down some explicit rules at the very beginning of, of group formation. They'll say things like, you know, in this group we're going to um, not be on our phones. We're going to uh, do all these things explicitly, and we're going to um, have these rules clearly stated. We're going to post them maybe somewhere. We're going to write them down, or maybe rules from bylaws or a constitution or things like that. But you might also have what we call implicit norms, um, which are not written down. They're not as uh, spoken necessarily, but they're things that we know that we shouldn't do, like uh, like we're not going to interrupt people. You probably don't need to write that down. That's just kind of a basic human behavior of courtesy when you're working with other people is that you don't interrupt them and you don't put them down. Those are implicit norms. And, and so every group's gonna, going to... Uh, uh, establish these explicit and implicit norms as part of the, the, the norming process. Um, now the sources of these norms, some of them come from outside the group, some of them are established by uh, you know the people who may have formed that group in the first place, or again may have written the bylaws, or, or maybe a boss who put that team together and, and uh, laid down some rules for you. Uh, maybe some of those norms come from there. Uh, other norms may come from individuals, other norms will come from the group as a whole, so there are different sources of norms that we'll see as part of the norming process, 
but all of them need to be identified and need to be uh, kind of respected. Also, you'll start to see some conformity in, in the norming stage, which can be good. It can also be bad, depending on the type of conformity you're getting. You want the type of conformity where people are committing to the group goals and are, and are working within those norms and those types of things. You don't want the kind of conformity where people are just um, going along to, to get along and um, not really doing so thoughtfully or, or mindfully. So. Um, you also need to be aware of the issue of non-conformity in a group. So you want that positive conformity. You want to avoid negative conformity. But we also need to be aware of non-conformity. What happens when a group member refuses to accept those norms and steps out of line? Well, the group's probably going to regulate that in a, in a number of ways. Um, and if it continues on long enough, then that, that non-conformity may result in some isolation of that group member and, and some exclusion of that group member, which is not entirely ideal. But... Uh, uh, but something to be aware of and, and identify as well in the norming process. So your to-dos for the norming process, your to-do list here for the norming uh, stage is, uh, first of all, adapt to the norms. I mean, again, that doesn't mean just follow along mindlessly, but, uh, but we need to be aware of what the norms of that group are and be willing to uh, conform to them as, as possible. We also need to identify norms that are too strict and be willing to challenge those. So if we come across these norms that are that are inhibiting group effectiveness because they're too strict and, and are restricting group members from being fully effective, then we need to challenge those norms and see if we can get them changed. Uh, and we also need to tighten up norms that are too loose, that are uh, and not quite strict enough. So finally, we get to the performing stage, hopefully. And once we get there, we need to be concerned with motivation versus social loafing. Um, social loafing is where a group member just kind of coasts along, or rides the coattails of other group members. We need to find ways to motivate group members and to um, restrict social loafing as, as much as possible within those groups. We also need to recognize that there are times when groups are better than individuals. Right? We get better performance out of a group than we do from individuals. And that happens a lot of times. And that's the whole reason we put up with groups, even though they can be a challenge, they can be a pain. Um, we do so because we get an increased performance um, from groups. Again, <clears throat> Excuse me. We talked about in a different video. We talked about synergy, the idea of the the uh, whole being greater than the sum of the parts. When we when we get that, when we get those multiple minds working together, uh, using their individual strengths and skills uh, for the betterment of the group, then we see those types of groups perform better than individuals. And we see that in complex tasks. We see that in things where, where you know again it requires different specialties. Now, there are times, however, when it, you know, a group is not necessarily better than individuals. If it's a very simple task, if it's something that one person can take on, uh, or if that group is particularly ineffective and you don't have it put together well, then, then individuals, uh, you may be better off using individuals rather than groups. But, uh, so there are times when that's the case. But, uh, but oftentimes, in the right uh, context, groups do perform in a superior way to individuals. The to-do list for the performing stage is, is a relatively short one. Uh, first of all, when you get into this stage, it's important to stay task focused. You're going to have some, you know, some um, uh, opportunities to develop relationships within groups as well, and to be social uh, and develop that social aspect of a group if you want. But you want to keep that on the outside of the group and allow individual members to pursue that. And when you're together as a group, you really want to stay task focused and, and stay focused on what that group is, is working on as much as possible. And then you want to encourage full participation. You don't want to let people um, slip through the cracks. If, if they're not speaking up, try and pull them in um, so that you get full participation. There's a, there's a reason that it, we say, you know, more heads are, two heads are better than one, three heads are better than one, so or, or whatever. You want that person's input. Just because they're quiet doesn't necessarily mean they don't have anything to add. Um, you should explore that fully and see if they do have something to add. So there we've seen Tuckman's phases of group development and discussed those. So um, again, forming, storming, norming, and performing. And I think if you think back to your group experiences, you can probably identify these, these group stages and these phases of group development. As always, if you have questions, feel free to email me. I'm happy to, to respond and discuss and provide feedback via email. Uh, and in the meantime, happy communicating.